Well, spring is in the air and I'm ready for a new series and I really hope uh, you get blessed by it as I have in starting to think and prepare for it. The theme, as I said, is what if, what if we really believed? And you could think that's about focusing on the past, but it really is focusing on the future. It's not so much looking back, but looking forward. It's not so about what we should have done, but what we can be and become. It's not about regrets because we leave them at the cross, never to be used against us. It's about having a refreshed vision for ourselves and for our church. Um, I remember David Ratz, he used to be with us at 1045. He's a long-term counsellor. And I got him to counsel me on this stage platform uh, about three years ago at a men's conference. So he, it was actually real-time counselling because I wanted to show people it wasn't a scary experience. And, uh, and I got him to talk about, guess what, my anger. Surprise, surprise. So there he is for about 20 minutes. He's hardcore counselling me, right? And in it, I remember he said this. He said, Ray, what if, no, he said this. What if you said goodbye to angry Ray? Now, that might seem profound to you, but that was like an amazing thought for me. He picked up the what if there was really reminding me, it was causing me to imagine a different Ray, that I wasn't tied to the patterns of my sin in the past, that I can think of me differently, that I was kind of, that change was possible. It was a really good question. And the thing today is, what if we really believe that we were followers of a crucified and risen Lord? And this whole series of what if we really believe, it's really picking up on the idea that faith, belief, trust is a really kind of a, a concept that can shrink on you at any given time and it can grow. There are times when you've got big faith, sometimes you've got little faith. And really we, we want everyone, it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're 6 or 66, you always got to be thinking that your best days as a Christian are always in front of you, not behind you. And that we're called in the Bible to not be lacking in zeal. doesn't matter whether you're single, married, widow, divorced, gay, straight. Go for it. Zeal. And at the heart, what we're really talking about is Jesus' call for discipleship. So let's pick it up in Mark chapter 8. It's the second account of the life of Jesus. Verse 34, because every sentence in the Bible has a number. This is the 34th sentence in that chapter. Jesus, uh, Mark reads, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Now I want you to read the rest of it with me out loud. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Notice that it's a word for everyone. Disciples and crowd. Insiders and outsiders. Uh, it's a whoever wants to come to me. It's, it's for anyone. It's for you. It's for me. And when Jesus says, take up your cross, remember, the only people taking up their cross in the first century were those who were about to be crucified on that cross. So Jesus is saying, come and be prepared to die. And you think, who is this? I mean, that sounds like a cult leader uh, and not some person you want to follow. Who has the right to ask such outrageous claims or some outrageous challenges? Who is this Jesus? Well, the opening of Mark's gospel tells us. In Mark chapter 1, verse 1, we read, The beginning of the good news about Jesus who? The Messiah, the Son of God. And you know what? As you flip through Mark chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, what you discover is here is Jesus in all his glory, in all his Father's authority as the Son of God, as the Messiah in Christ. And it is so clear he is who he claims to be. My goodness, when he's caught in a storm, what does he say? But shut up. When he's confronted by demons, he says, get out. When faced with a disabled man, he says, get up. When he meets men who fear God, he said, follow me. When he's taken to a dead girl, he says, Arise, little girl. And when he speaks of his own death, he says, I must die and I will rise again. And best of all, when he meets us in our absolute mess, he says, your sins are forgiven. Whoa. There is no corner where Jesus is not in charge. From storms to sickness and from Satan to sin, he's got it all covered. There's no limit to his power, but not everyone worked it out. Or not everyone worked out who he was, even though they had seen him at his very best. Mark 8, verse 27. Jesus and his disciples or followers went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. 
On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. So in Jesus' day, like today, everyone's got an opinion about who Jesus is. And the disciples pretty much give Jesus the top three theories. But when all said and done, it came down to the fact that everyone, most people thought he was some kind of prophet dude, you know. And so after, think about it, after everything Jesus has said, after everything he has done, the best they could come up with is that he was a prophet. And that's what marks them out as outsiders. They brought Jesus, you see, down to size, down to our size. So in the end, he's just a slightly bigger, better version of you and me. And let's face it, who's going to bend the knee? Who's going to change their lifestyle? Who's going to take up their cross and follow someone who's just a bigger, better version of you or me? And yet virtually every world religion reduces Jesus to the box of prophet. Uh, Hindus more than happy to call him a guru. Buddhists and Baha'is don't mind quoting him. Islam explicitly calls him a prophet. No one has a bad word to say about Jesus. And what you notice is Jesus is raised up high enough for you to give him a degree of respect, but kept low enough so that you don't have to surrender your life to him. And that's the problem. That's what makes that view of Jesus, or that's what causes that view of Jesus to come from people who are outsiders of Christ. And then Jesus says, well, you've told me what the world thinks about me. Now I want you to tell me what you think about me. You've been with me up close and personal now for three years, boys. It's time to come clean. And so Jesus says, well, in verse 29, let's read it out. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Now, sooner or later, you're going to have to answer that question, eh? Who do you think Jesus is? And getting the answer right is a matter of eternal life and eternal death. So I beg you, make sure you know what the answer to that question is. Well, in a sense, Peter's already told us. Now you need to know what he means by it. Peter, so Jesus, you know, Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And Peter gets up, one of the 12, he's been with him for three years, and he stands up, and on behalf of the group, he says, Jesus, you are the Messiah, or Christ. Same word, one's in Hebrew, one's in Greek. Okay, you are the Christ, and you think, well, what do we do? I mean... You know, I'm Galea, you're Lee, he's Christ. You know, mum and dad, Mr. and Mrs. Christ. What's the big deal? He knows Jesus' surname. Because when you hear Jesus Christ, everyone thinks Christ is a surname. It's not a surname. It's a title. It's a title. It speaks of that Jesus is God's appointed king of the world. It's a big title. So let me explain what I mean. Let's say John is your name and plumber is your job title and your job description is to fix taps, okay? Then Jesus is his name. Christ, or Messiah, is his job title. And his job description is to rule the universe and everyone in it. So Peter says, you are the Messiah. He's saying a lot, that the world was created through him and the world was created for him. And you will never find the meaning of life until you hook up with Jesus. Now, there is a billion miles, kilometers between having respect for Jesus as a prophet, which many do, and having Jesus as your king and your Lord and master and savior. And I'm so glad that a friend of mine, in fact, she was here this morning at 1045, her and her husband, dear long-term friends, she said to me 38 years ago, Ray, um, you've got to have to make a decision about Jesus. He's either Lord, lunatic, or liar. Which is it to be? And I knew what she was getting at. If he wasn't my Lord, then things needed to change. But what kind of a Lord, what kind of a king, what kind of a Messiah is he? And verse 31 now comes into surprising language. They weren't expecting this. Jesus said, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man, that's Jesus, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So Jesus is saying, let me introduce you to what the kind of Messiah Christ I am. I must die. Sorry, I must suffer. I must be rejected. I must be killed, and I must rise from the dead. So important is that, that three times in Mark's gospel, it's repeated. This is God's great plan to rescue the world. 
Now, you and I must die because, let's face it, the wages of sin is death. Okay? That's the pay packet at the end of our life. A coffin. Or if you're cremated. Christ must die because this is God's plan to bring about the forgiveness of the world. The word must means two very different things. The must here is speaking that this is God's ordained plan. This is the only lifeline thrown out to us. And Peter, one of the 12, who said to Jesus, you are the Messiah, he hears this about how Jesus thinks he's going to end up on a cross, and, and he kind of wraps him over the knuckles. Um, you know, there's no way you're going to the cross, man. You are the Christ. Look at verse 32 again. It's, it's the end of the previous verse. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He just called him the king of kings, and G Peter is now rebuking him. Now, there's something a little bit endearing about this, a little bit stupid all at the same time. It's endearing because why is Peter doing it? He doesn't want his saviour and friend to go to the cross. That's lovely. It's stupid because Peter needs Jesus to go to the cross for his sins and our sins. Remember, this is God's only plan to rescue you and me. You see, for Jesus, Peter wants a Christ without a cross. But for Jesus, the only good Christ is a dead one. For Jesus, a Christ without a cross is no Christ at all. Absolutely useless. Otherwise, if he didn't go to that cross, we would all die in our sins. And heaven wouldn't have one single human being in it including you and me. I reckon if the other 12 or the other 11 worked out what Peter was doing, discouraging Jesus from going to the cross, man, they would have jumped him on the spot, started to strangle him and say, shut up, you idiot. If he doesn't go to the cross, we're going to hell. Keep your mouth shut. But they didn't get it either. Not at that stage anyway. Well, Peter's name means rocky. And at this point, he's not so much a rock upon which to build your faith. He's more like a stumbling block to trip over. Verse 33. When Peter turned, sorry, when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. That's amazing. Within two minutes, Peter goes from getting it really right to getting it really wrong. That's why we love Peter, because I think we all identify with him. Jesus calls Peter by the name of his worst enemy, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Man, Talk about a demotion. He goes from being disciple to being an agent of Satan. But which is it, friends? Because it's interesting, isn't it? By wanting a Christ without a cross, Jesus says to Peter, you know, you think like a human. You don't think like me. You don't think like God. That you side with Satan. If you wanted Jesus without a cross, you side with Satan. You do not side with me. That you trust in yourself to get you into heaven. You don't trust in me and my death and resurrection for you. For the forgiveness of your sins. And can I say, if you don't get this at this point, then the next step is going to be a big one and you will not understand it. You will somehow think that what we're about to say is how you get to heaven. Uh, uh, uh. The only way we get there is through the death and resurrection. It's what he has done for us. And once you grasp that there's nothing he can't forgive, then you take the next step and hear what Jesus has to say. For those who want to follow him on his terms, we read in verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple, my follower, must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Uh -oh. The road of the Messiah now is the same road that the Messiah's people are going to walk. Okay, so if we really believe in a crucified Jesus, we'll be getting the fact that suffering is part of the deal. First the suffering, then the glory. We don't just get to follow Jesus, the prophet, and quote nice words to each other. We follow Jesus who got it in the gut, in the hands, got stripped naked, beaten, shamed, and nailed on that cross as he took full responsibility for our failures. Friends, Christ does not ask you to do anything that he hasn't asked himself to do. That you are required to give up your life only because he has first given up his life for you on a much grander scale. Now, don't get me wrong. The Christian life is the best life. I've had 20 years as a non-Christian. I've had 37 years as a Christian. I'm telling you, the 37 years 
leave the, the first 20 years of my life for dead. Much better. That Jesus came that we have life and have it to the max. I never feel ripped off by following Jesus. But you and I have got to understand, if you decide to follow Jesus for the first time, and if you're following him now, you've got to keep counting the cost. You've got to keep counting the, because it is a relationship with Jesus on his terms. Otherwise, you've just got a relationship with yourself. And you can't save you. So it got, got me thinking, okay, I want to be a follower of Jesus. I've got to deny myself. I've got to say no to me or a part of me and say yes to Jesus, whatever the cost. So what exactly am I saying no to? Well, I think Mark 7 verse 21 gives us a nice list and it comes from the mouth of Jesus. Mark 7 21 says this, For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Wow, I thought it was everyone else's fault but mine. But according to Jesus, it's my fault. <laughs> that all the stuff and junk that comes out of me wasn't put there because of Satan or the world or the culture I'm in. I've met the enemy it's me. <laughs> that the heart of the problem is the problem of the human heart. I'm not saying the world and the devil don't play their part, but I'm telling you, the problem starts from within. What a profound diagnosis is that? You can see why Jesus had to die on the cross for us, didn't you? Just check that. You don't even have to understand half of those words to know. That's a pretty serious list. And I love the fact that he puts murder right next to, say, envy. Or he puts adultery right next to lying. He just got to wax them all together. They're all evil. So you want to be a follower of Jesus, it means you've got to put him first. What that means is it's a series of saying no. All of a sudden, your, your own personal life becomes a war zone, whereas a soldier, not a citizen, you take up arms and you want to put sin to death. So you say no, for example... Let's pick up some of the things on that list. No to sexual immorality. That means, get this, no sex outside of a relationship between a married couple, which the Bible defines as a, as a man and a woman. That, like, well, already, it's countercultural. No, that means sex, boyfriend, not on the agenda. Not even with your engaged, no, that's not on the agenda. Until you're married, you're not married. No to theft. No, no to cutting corners and taking that which is not yours. Pretty important when we come time to tax and filling it out properly. No to greed. And the only way you can deal with greed is by being generous. Jesus says you can't love money and love God. One of them is going to turn on the other. No to deceit. No more lying to cover up embarrassment. I don't know about you. The time I'm most tempted to lie is when I've, I've done something stupid or I've made a mistake and I want to cover it up. No to envy. Wow. That I choose to be content with what I have and how I look. Ooh. Isn't that hard? I choose to be content with what I have and how I look. Notice slander, that I don't want to put someone down out of revenge because they hurt me and paid out on me on Facebook. Notice arrogance, I refuse to think of myself more highly than I should. And so it goes, friends, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. You know, let me remind you again. Who were the only people taking up their cross in the first century? It was people going to hang on that cross and die. One famous Christian, a man by the name of Bonhoeffer, who was killed by Hitler during World War II, he said this, he was a pastor, and he said this, when Christ calls a person, he bids him to come and die. That's the kind of Christianity that's on the table. When Christ calls a person, he bids him to come and die. Die to oneself. And Bonhoeffer said the great enemy of the modern church is cheap grace. It's a very powerful phrase, that. Cheap grace. What does he mean? I mean, we love grace at MBM. We take sin seriously. We take grace even more seriously, right? We love grace. We preach grace. We live in grace. We try to show grace to each other. Grace means that there's nothing God can't forgive that you've done. It's fair. He offers you a blank. I don't care who you are, what you've done. He offers you a blank slate. But that's grace. But cheap grace is about taking forgiveness but without repentance. It's like taking the gift of salvation, 
but saying no to the Savior. I don't want a relationship with you. Cheap grace is a Christianity where there is no denying. There is no dying to oneself. Cheap grace wants to justify the sins we do rather than see oneself as a justified sinner. And the result is, in too many cases, we start to spend our whole life basically living for pleasure, where you pack as much pleasure into your life just up until you're kind of going to, about to get disqualified by being called a Christian. Then you pull slightly, slightly back. You know, this series, in part, is to bring some of us from the edge of compromise. We were running a really fine line with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. And you know, it's really hard to tell whether you're kind of like a, like a bad pagan or a lukewarm Christian. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. That's, what Je- that's the call from Jesus. You know, a couple of years ago, I, um, I interviewed a woman on this platform called Amelia. And she was from an Indian Muslim background. She'd become a Christian. And uh, as a result of that, her parents wanted to have nothing to do with her. I thought, my goodness. I mean, my mum cried every day for two years when I, when I left her religion, when I became a Christian. But she still loved me and I loved her. She told me, Amelia said, told, I saw when she was interviewed, my parents no longer want to have anything to do with me. And when she said it, I kind of instinctively said, oh my goodness, Amelia, that must have been so hard. And I'm telling you, I didn't have a second's pause when she said, No, Ray, it's nothing compared to what my Jesus has done for me. That the suffering I'm experiencing with my mother's rejection is nothing compared to the great cost to Jesus when he went to the cross and experienced hell for my sins. Oh, my goodness. Amelia, I mean, I might have been preaching on the day, but she gave the better sermon by a long shot. She's still preaching through me right now. Amelia was absolutely right. I don't know if you've ever heard of Napoleon. He's that short, left-handed French emperor. I say that because I'm short and left-handed. And he said this, I will tell you, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne and myself founded great empires, but our empires were founded on force. Jesus alone founded his empire on love. And to this day, Millions would die for him. It's powerful, isn't it? Now, we may not all physically die, but look, very rarely, it's unlikely any of us are going to die for Jesus. I know things are turning in our culture, but let's be honest. I don't think in the next 50 years anyone's going to get a bullet in the head for Jesus. Although some of our missionaries live in places where they're not far from having their lives threatened, so you need to keep praying for them. But what we're told here is it's, becoming a Christian is a dying experience. That is, we die that we may gain life. And, and uh, here's one helpful image that I think uh, has benefited lots of people. Picture your, your life like it were a house filled with many rooms. And when we accept Christ, we bring him into our building, so to speak. And, uh, and, and he has a right of access into every corner of our life, pictured like every room in our life. I think we've got a floor plan just to picture it. Because Jesus has come to transform every part of your life. And so it it kind of there, we've got just a friends, church, work, sex, money. But you can keep going, whatever list you want to have. So let me just ask you a question as you have this kind of word picture in your mind. Which room in your life have you kept shut from Jesus? Which part of your life won't you let Jesus speak to? Kind of got the door locked, says no entry, Jesus. Which idol are you nursing? Or which room have you kicked him out of? That is, in your younger Christian days, might have been like two years ago, he was in there working with you on your sexual purity, say, or your willingness to forgive. But now mm -mm, the door's closed. I don't want you in there. I've still got some partying and fun to do. And so you just kick him out. Is it not time to bring him back in and be set free? Because you know that letting Jesus... Or rather, denying, denying yourself, taking up your cross. In fact, Luke's gospel says, taking up your cross daily. That it's a day-by-day experience. And people tell me who have, I'm not into renovation, but people who work on their houses and love to do it. So, you know, you, you work on one part of your house, you fix up the bathroom, it looks really good. And just when you finish, you think, job done. You think, 
oh man, that garage is a real mess. So you start working on the garage, and then you think, oh, I've done it at last. And you think, oh no, that lounge room's still not right. And, you, and you, it's a never-ending project. And you know what? That's exactly how you need to see the Christian life. You're constantly working. Once, you, once you've worked on this part and got it right, then you realize that part needs to get right. But you never get tired of working and at the renovation of letting Jesus be Lord. Now, for those of you who are wondering, you know, really? I'm not sure I want to become a Christian. Jesus bids me to come and die? I don't think so. Well, let's, let's hear from Jesus about what the alternative is. Verse 35. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man, Jesus, will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. In Jesus' kingdom, you gain life by losing it. It's back to front. It's a back to front religion. In Jesus' kingdom, he won't be ashamed of you if you're not ashamed of him. In Jesus' kingdom, he says, look, it makes absolutely no sense if you get it right on every decision and make, and make a mistake on Jesus. So what if you gain the whole world? Which, by the way, you're not going to do. But imagine if you gain the whole world and then forfeit your soul because you decided to give Jesus the flick. So what if you get it right on every decision? Spouse, job, investment, health, whatever. And for some reason, sidestep Jesus' call, who says to you, come. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. What a tragedy. See, what's the, what is the most important thing you have? It's you. <laughs> you are the most important thing you have. So don't blow it. Please. What good is it for a person to gain the whole world, whatever that means to you, and live with, without, without, without Christ in a Christless eternity? I don't know if you know the, the name Hugh Hefner. He died recently, and uh, he was the guy who um, produced Playboy magazine that uh, really made porn respectable and destroyed a whole lot of marriages and enslaved a number of people here at MBM, still to this day. There he was with his you know, 16 blonde bikini girls always around him, smoking his pipe and in his after jacket, relaxing at home in his slippers, he denied himself no pleasure. He gained the world. But as of a couple of weeks ago, his life on this earth ended and he now stands before the judge and the holy righteous judge. And I tell you, there's not one guy in the world that is envying him right now. In contrast, what have we got at MBM? 80 people this very year. Adults, teenagers, and kids who've decided to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Jesus. They gave up on gaining the world so they can gain life everlasting. It's what MBM has been built on, really. We got this far how? I'll tell you how we got here. Because of the sheer grace of God that has enabled you and I to say no to sin and yes to Jesus. You know, they say where there's no gain, sorry, where the, uh, there is no gain, where there is no what? No gain because there's no pain. That's exactly right. And our plans, our God-desired outcomes, our good plans to make, say, a thousand new disciples, yeah, it's a good plan. That's a pleasing plan to God. That plan comes at a cost. That's why it was such a delight to see over a hundred more people took on pledges last year than the year before. Um, and I think a good number from this congregation for the very first time. Because that cost needs to be carried at some level. You know, every church plant we do, every new service we do comes at a cost. It means more people need to serve. Uh, every time we release a group, you know, there were 25 people who are now fellowshipping in Smithfield in that new church plant that used to be with us here. I miss them. They miss us. We grieve. They grieve. There's a loss. There's always a cost. We had to pay for a new pastor as well on top of everything else, pay for rent in Smithfield Primary School. Like there's cost, cost, cost. I tell you what, and then it's left a hole here so that more people in this congregation needed to serve. Cost, cost, cost. But let me tell you, it was worth everything. And it's all built on this simple truth. And it needs this simple truth to be enacted, that for us to achieve these goals, we need a thriving church where everyone is denying themselves, taking up their cross 
and following our glorious Lord Jesus. Do you know why we do this series? I tell you why, because when the living Lord Jesus comes, and remember, we believe in the living Jesus. When he comes, he's not just going to assess each of your lives individually. He's going to assess us as a church. You know, Jesus judges churches. You see Revelation 2 and 3. And every church will be brought before the judgment seat of Christ. You know, Mitchell Bree Anglican is going to be brought before the judgment seat of Christ. Uniting Church Rudy Hill is going to be brought before the judgment seat of Christ. And there's going to be a time when we're going to be brought. When Jesus returns in all his glory, a lot of us are going to be put together and stand. After you've had your individual judgment, the, I don't know which order, uh, we're going to come together as the church of MBM. And Jesus is going to issue a verdict about who we are as a church, not just how you and I operated individually, but how we were as a church. And I don't know about you, but I'm hanging Hanging on the hope that he will say when, he's, when he looks us in the eye, brothers and sisters of MBM, you truly denied yourselves, took up your cross daily and followed me. Well done, good and faithful servants. Now, I don't know if he's going to say that. I don't know what he's going to say, but I do know this. I'm investing my passion, my prayers, my finances, my service with that goal. I live for those words that are going to come out of his mouth. Not just about my life, but about our church. The challenge for you today is, I wonder if you want to live for that opinion. Because friends, it's the only opinion that counts. Let's pray. Oh Lord Jesus, you are glorious. Let us hold nothing back from you, Lord. Help us to know that whatever you ask of us, you have given far more. May this teaching series make us as a church at MBM, a church that counts the cost and keeps counting the cost and takes seriously the call, the call to be fully committed disciples of Jesus Christ. This is our privilege. This is our calling. This is our passion. In Jesus' precious name, amen.